An Altar on the Village Green From Book One of The Chained God Written by Nathan Hall Narration, Music, and Sound Design by Alex Schiffer One, the church. A year ago, I sat with parents as their child died of plague. A single unasked question rang through those long hours in an unending refrain. The silence after his last breath had carried a finality that might have been mistaken for relief. The air in the church tonight held the same tortured waiting the same question. Bleak-eyed churchgoers held hushed conversations, filled with wringing hands and shaking heads. The pews were half full, the most I'd seen in years, but nothing to the standing room crowd I remembered from the months after I had first arrived in Ymrit. Desperation wear the skin of faith, but it never fit well. I looked past the congregation to the large, blunt bricks of wine-dark red stone, sculpted in relief against the walls. The chains felt at home. Long lines of the links stretched to the back wall, where they wound along the floor toward the raised slab serving as a dais. Its gray slate was solid as any foundation immovable as a cornerstone. A barbed spike, tall as my waist and wrist thick, surged upward through the center of the slab, easier than a nail might have driven through lumber. Spindly cracks ran the length of the stone, all centered around the wound like the spike had made. The anchor. Focusing on it brought an ache to my eyes. The many candles around the dais cast shadows of the spike dancing on a shallow pool of honey liquid springing from the center of the dais. Around me, churchgoers shuffled out of the sanctuary. Evening light from the antechamber seeped away as the heavy rosewood doors shut. High Cantor Arras stepped down the aisle between high-backed pews. I expected him to stop beside me, but he passed by to approach the dais. The cantor's copper skin had leathered with age, but he stood as straight-backed and alert as I. His robes were scarlet as my scarf. Their golden scrollwork brought chains to mind. Like all members of the church, he wore iron shackles around each wrist. Links of chain trailed to scrape dryly against the floor. Almost without realizing it, I turned a shackle around one wrist, little more than an iron circlet, its links barely clinking against each other. Though I'd worn them long enough that their chafing floated beneath my notice, I'd only earned the four. My fingers paused at the third, I had never been able to figure whether it had been for my efforts in the outer city during the plague, or for sitting with the parents of that dying boy. Join me, the cantor ordered, drawing me from my reflection. He didn't speak to me. Instead, he stepped to the very foot of the dais. An arthritic hand reached out, and his finger made contact with the sharp point of the anchor. A spot of blood sprang to the surface, gathered, and then finally dropped into the pool, clouding the gold where it had hit. Ripples rose to a lapping wave against the stone, and fell back to peace as the droplet clouded and spun and dispersed. The thoughtless ease with which the cantor retrieved a cloth from his pocket and dabbed it to his finger spoke of years of long practice. An ache behind my eyes had grown as I'd focused on the blade-keen edge of the anchor. 
my first finger had calloused on its tip, so I pricked my second instead. The substance swallowed three drops hungrily before I wrapped a cloth on my own against the wound. For a moment, as the drops hit, the lines of the anchor glowed in the same sunset and amber of my blood mingling below. As long as one suffers, I suffer, the cantor murmured. As long as one is chained, I am chained. My reverence at my god's promise hadn't eroded from repetition. Instead, with every drop of blood spilled, and every repeated uttering, I stepped closer to understanding the magnitude of its oath, like an insect's understanding of the weather. My god shared in the shackles and bleeding of its people, and even offered freedom from horror through the strength of the lances. How could a single lifetime suffering from others begin to compare? An eternity trapped in horror shrank before its unending sacrifice. The silence stretched on. I could almost feel Cantor Araz's reluctance in the set of his shoulders. He waited in safety, hoping I would go away. I could wait no more. Olmia has fallen. The cantor's shoulders sagged. For a moment he looked like the old man he was, rather than the ageless teacher from my youth. I was going to tell you tonight, child, I'm sorry. My shrug was a lie. The pain twisting my features might have been from the anchor's sharpness against my eyes. Hi, cantor. It's time for me to be raised to Lance. Out there, I can serve our god. You can serve it here. He hesitated on the verge of saying more. I watched the same points he'd used in the past die before they could leave his mouth. There are other ways to lessen suffering, child. You've made soup for the poor, tended to the ill. His eyes found my shackles the link I was still abstinently turning. Comforted the dying. And you will keep doing so. High Cantor Araz had given his answer. The conversation ended here. No one argued with the High Cantor. Least of all a lonely page. I could have stayed within the church's walls. Preparing poultices and brewing tea during the plague... Was that the best way to serve? Was that what earned this link? I flicked my chains. You taught me yourself. Look always to the cause, and the suffering outside the walls is only a symptom. The horrors must be ended, the land's freed. The high cantor's hand settled on my shoulder, and he turned us from the anchor. The ache in my eyes caused by the anchor gradually faded, as the cantor waited each word. Let me explain a different way. At some point, when you were treating the child, you knew that poultices and tea weren't going to save him. Yes, his eyes. What I'm saying, child, is that your duty called you to comfort the parents more than treat the child. Sometimes it is too late for treatment. Realization was like standing at the cliff's edge. Speaking was like jumping. You're not just talking about the child. You believe the world is dying. I believe that sometimes... Sometimes our duty is to bring comfort. Disbelief curdled on my tongue. You know who's comforted? The parents of the children who never got sick. Because the church protected them. As we are sworn to. As only we can. Can we, Paige? For a moment I saw the lance that had freed four fallen lands in a single year. My teacher. My hero. The set of his jaw made his next words all the more astonishing. 
the time of the lances has passed. Each blade lost only proves it further. We should focus on keeping those within the walls fed and healthy. Those in the outer city, too, if we can manage it. Protect who we can, preserve while we can. And leave the world trapped in a nightmare forever. Because ignoring our duty is more comforting. Even as horror eats its way to our very doorstep. I was in his face. In the high canter's face. I'd all but called him a coward. And I'd meant it. I swallowed. Preparing for a reprimand. Preparing for pot scrubbing or floor sweeping. Not preparing for an apology. High Cantor Araz didn't look angry. He looked tired. So be it. Two. The Chained God. There were many doors in the ancient church, but tonight, the one that the High Cantor waited for me in front of was the only one that mattered. In the same way that the upper floors wrapped around the sanctuary, the basement, mostly storerooms and serving quarters, wrapped around a larger center. Unlike the sanctuary, whose many doors led out into the halls on every side, only one door led into the chamber at the church's core. A door of stone, carved with chains that met at a hand-tall recess in the shape of an anchor. I'd walk past the door a hundred times, always wondering what lay within. Speaking of its contents, or what took place therein, was forbidden. In my lessons, I learned one thing about whatever lay ahead. Pages entered, and lances left. As long as I had lived at the church, to the best of my knowledge, the door had remained unopened. Handing me the lantern he had brought, the high canter retrieved a golden pendant from a chain around his neck. A hand tall in the shape of an anchor, it fit into the recess smoothly. As it clicked into place, another click from somewhere within the door sounded, and the door opened with a scrape of stone on stone. Cantor Raz claimed the key and tucked it away, ushering me through the arched doorway ahead of him. He pushed the door shut behind us. Beyond was a stairway leading down. The walls and stairs were the same gray slate as the altar. Smooth, solid, eternal. As though it was carved from one hole. The closed space of the stairwell would have made some pages panic. But I hardly noticed. What bothered me was the quiet as if the passage weren't part of the church, or even part of our world. I tried to track how far we descended. Four stories, five. Nothing punctuated the steps. No railings, landings, or turnings. No torches or candles or even rushes. The silence had a weight, a substance. It refused to break. I opened my mouth more than once but words always died in my throat. That was it. It was a deathly quiet. The quiet of a crypt, of a stone sarcophagus. The living could only ever trespass here. I had almost convinced myself that the steps would continue forever when they ended. My first step on even ground was into a chamber not much larger than those the church allowed its pages. On the far side of the chamber, alabaster pillars separated this room from more darkness ahead. They were unlike any I had seen before, wider around the base, and thin at the top, almost like giant fangs sprouting from some monstrous jaw. My next step landed atop rugs made from bands of brightly colored wool, braided together in intricate knots. Memory made me smile. The first task a page was given, before being allowed to begin training, was to braid such a rug. 
most of the floor was covered in them, arranged and overlaid to dazzle the eye. There must have been a hundred, but what were they doing here? The walls were covered in a breathtaking fresco. Hundreds of creatures crowded every inch. Some looked almost like animals from our world. I thought I saw a bear with a great eagle's wings, and a crocodile standing upright. But most had too many body parts or too few, seemingly plucked at random from other creatures. It hurt my head to imagine how some of them might move, and some of them did not look like living creatures at all. Were these an artist's rendition of horrors? They all shared one thing in common, all of them, or all with a discernible front, faced outward, as though watching me. I shivered, tearing my eyes away. Benches lined the walls, the same rosewood as the pews above ground. In fact, this room could have been a twin to the antechamber in the main building. Did that make the room beyond the pillars another sanctuary? And if so, why would our church need two? I'd expected the high canter to pause here, to try one more time to change my mind. But instead, he passed me by, as I looked around the room and stepped out beyond the pillars. I started to follow, but at the bottom of the handful of steps beyond the pillars, something drew me up short. As high canter Araz stepped down one side of the room, following a back wall, I tried to identify what stirred the hairs on my neck. The room seemed boundless. The lantern light a tiny, frail thing, in danger of being snuffed by the darkness. But it wasn't the room's size that set me on edge. The air trembled against my skin from a distant movement. I caught a sound the next time, too slight, too far away, and yet too immense to make sense of. Another, and another, almost continuous. I didn't want to be alone. Quickening my pace to make up for my hesitation, I caught up with Cantor Araz. Together, we reached a stone brazier, as wide as my outstretched arms, covered in markings. The bottom of the bowl was filled with a vicious liquid. Lantern oil? and a waist-high lever sprouted near the base, metal gleaming in the lantern light, as if new and freshly oiled. I looked over my shoulder at the unknown darkness. It would take a lot more than one brazier to light this chamber. The high canter braced himself with both hands on one lever, and strained, his face lined with effort. Just as I was about to ask if he needed help, the lever finally made a sound, like teeth grinding, and gave away. A dry scrape was followed by a spark at the very bottom of the bowl, and the oil burst into flame. A heartbeat later, fire burst in a dozen other places, casting the chamber into brightness. How? I managed, throwing a hand over my eyes, squinting, I looked at Cantor Araz, but he didn't answer. Instead, through slitted eyes, he looked toward the center of the room. My eyes followed, and all my questions about the brazier fell away. Chains as thick as my forearm lined walls and ceiling and floor, winding about the many thin fluted columns on either side of the chamber. They all traced inward toward a being in the middle of the room. Naked, hairless, slender yet ripping with muscles, the form looked almost human at one glance, and incomprehensible at the next. It was a good ten times my height, tall enough for its head to scrape the domed ceiling, were it not on what appeared to be knees. Four arms along its sides, and two on its back, were held outstretched in different directions by the chains. A bulbous head lacked ears or nose or mouth, 
Instead, one great round eye took up half of its face. On either side and above, smaller eyes swiveled to view the room. But the primary eye was still, cloudy in a way that brought cataracts to mind. But then that head turned. That great eye looked at me. An invisible finger rifled through the pages of my mind. Everything I had been or done, said or thought, lifted like ink onto its fingertips. Tendril-like antenna atop its head twitched. Wounds lined its body. Thin, angular shapes. A language? And anchors spiked through its skin along each shackle holding them into place. Liquid seeped from each of its countless wounds, gold and orange, catching the light so it seemed to glow. The pool around its legs rippled in the patterns that did not always match the rhythm of the dripping or its occasional incidental movements. Ikor, golden lifeblood of the Chained God. Terrifying, is it not? Heat bloomed on my face as I turned to the canter. For a moment, I'd forgotten he existed. He wasn't looking at me, though. When I first saw it, I'd feared I'd wet myself. What a start to my journey that would have been. I nodded, trying and failing to summon a smile. As I'd gaze into its eye, something had skittered into the recesses of my mind. Not thought, not memory, not reason. Something chittering in the dark. Looking at it made my head hurt like a muscle overextended. But I found my eyes drawn to it every time I pulled them away. And every time it looked into me, I grew more certain. Something sat behind the cloud of that eye. Intelligence, awareness, intention immense enough to swallow the lights of the sky. I forced myself to examine the room further. The chamber shared most of its dimensions with the sanctuary above, but must have stretched half again as tall. Its domed ceiling shrouded in shadows. Along both sides of the chamber, a little under halfway up the walls, a handful of braziers blazed. How had they been lit? To my eyes, nothing connected the one beside us to those on the walls. I had heard nothing to indicate a mechanism, or fire moving beneath the floor, or in the walls. And even if there had been, it would not have moved so quickly. My mind took refuge in the mystery. Mundane as it was in comparison to the being before me, it softened the sudden sensation of falling that engulfed me. The walls were all the same stone as the tunnel had been, carved floor to ceiling along the expanse with the same sorts of runes that had been cut into the being. The floor ceased to be slate as it drew near to the giant figure. A circle of ground half the width of the room, and a shallow bowl around the being like shores of a lake, was wine-dark redstone. Runes made an inward spiral toward the being growing even smaller and more intricate. Where it dipped beneath the surface of the ichor, they ceased to be discernible shapes and almost seemed a single texture. I can't hear, I said. The words refused to form. I found myself stammering. Our god has been below our feet? My entire life? I didn't quite say aloud that he'd lied all these years by not telling me, but Cantor Araz nodded as though he'd heard. He walked before me, closer to our god, drawing my attention to the six redstone deities, standing like crenellations between us and it. Child, for those such as you and I, people of true faith, seeing our god is a revelation. Are you not awed by the vastness in its gaze? I had no words. Again, Cantor Araz nodded as though I had spoken my thoughts. 
as though my thoughts were more than a roiling, senseless mass. But we both know that there are churchgoers who only believe while they bleed, people of half-faith, clinging to their children's stories, people who only wish to see what they expect, people who could never accept the truth. The truth. I watched the Ikor ripple, dance as if it stirred by winds on distant shores. Our god is not finite, trivial, human. In the cantor's mouth, human was an insult. I nodded. I didn't have the courage for more. The cantor gestured to the daises, topped by waist-tall stands. Five of the platforms stood empty. Without waiting for my ascent, Cantor Araz approached the second-last dais. A sword stood from the fixture along the side of the dais, gold-capped and ringed in silver. The black of the hilt looked rigid, as if to remain secure when slick. Fitted along the side was a black and silver open-ended sheath with hard leather straps and steel buckles. Atop the podium, a rune-etched silver flask stood against one side, beside a long needle, and near the center sat a book. Thick, hardback and leather-bound, the book was worked with designs in gold and silver, and embossed with more of that strange script. As a child, I thought the blades were the most important equipment of a lance, it was they that allowed a lance to destroy the source of horror, after all. To draw all of the madness that blackened the world into themselves, freeing the land from its suffering. But without the flask's healing, without the book's binding, without the anchor's cleansing, a lance would be doomed to fall prey to the horror as surely as one of its victims. Lost to the madness of the place, living the same violence and dying the same death in a loop forever. With the book, Cantor Araz had taught me himself ages ago, death becomes a nuisance. The high Cantor lifted the book, his fingers tracing the shapes on the cover, as if in memory. It is time you learned why I have been trying to change your mind, Paige. It is. I managed to keep the heat out of my voice. The cantor's wry smile was at odds with his stiff posture. You know about the fallen lances. Of course. My eyes found the empty daises, each slightly different, but much the same. All empty. One of them, I knew, had been empty for the length of our history. More than one had been lost in the years just before I was born. I couldn't tell which was which. You know the names of the lances who have fallen, Cantor Araz said. Those that you know, in any case. You likely know every maddening detail there is to know about each one of them. I shrugged rather than deny the fact. But there is one thing that none of your studies have taught you. Is there? My eyes strayed toward our god. Was there another world-shifting secret? Another lie of omission? Cantor Araz sighed, rubbing a temple. It is one thing to know something and another to understand. The book slapped down on the podium, making me jump. They were my friends, child. Cantor Araz's hand trembled where it sat on the book. They were my friends. And you. I'm prepared for the ceremony, I said, with a conviction I didn't feel. Are you? I've read the stories, all of them. I sounded defensive, petulant. Bedtime stories to scare children, and they had scared me. A ruin that drove an entire city to suicide. Animals, pet 
farm or wild growing monstrous and violent, until the town was devoured by sheep and chickens. I thought that I had known that these were people, not characters in some campfire tale. It had taken the news of Olima to turn knowledge into a fist of stone in my stomach, to turn my desire to help into a duty I could not shrink. Those sunny, welcoming people trapped in their horror, forced to relieve their death for all time. Stories, Cantor Arise said. I've read the letters Lance's wrote. Throughout history, they saved people from unending suffering. You did. The cantor clicked his tongue. Have you ever had to murder a child, Paige? The question knocked me onto my heels. No, but a child. Sniveling from the cold. Begging for help. Her hair matted with dirt and blood. A smear of it along her cheek. Where perhaps... A parent had a single moment of clarity to say goodbye and sent her running. The cantor's eyes were dark with memory. Murdered her. Because what the little girl turns into has already torn out your throat before. Hi, cantor. Have you killed her ten times? A hundred times? Times enough that murdering her becomes just one more task you must accomplish to make progress? Those eyes, still bleak but now sharp, landed on me. No. No, I suppose you haven't, child. You won't be forced to do the impossible while you are down in the fallen lands. Not once. Instead, you'll be forced to do it again. And again, and again, as many times as you die. Each horrifying choice you make, you make a hundred times. It must be such a relief to the struggling lance to give in to the madness of a place. Failure is a comfort when success means torment. I... I understand. You know... But will you come to understand, if you are set on this path? I imagine killing that child. Imagine giving a piece of my heart to the darkness I'd need to do that murder. Then, I imagine the child alive, wandering forever down the same stretch of muddy village street, crying for parents now dead or monstrous, turning into a monster herself, and the innocent that child might murder. All of it, again and again, without rest. My voice was steady. As you said, High Cantor, I won't be dissuaded. The Cantor's eyes softened. No, I suppose you won't. He opened the book and flipped through hundreds of pages. Writing in various languages flitted by, still clean and clear as they might have been before the ink dried. Between the writing were far more pages filled by strange colored dots. You see, a lance who has returned may write their experiences here, to whoever might come after. Many have chosen not to, I assume, from the silences between each passage. But some have. I did. And the dots? Ah, here. The page he stopped on was blank. He set the book down. A ridge along the top keeping the place. Give me your hand. No, here, on the book. He positioned my hand, palm up above the book. My eyes moved to the needle that waited beside the flask. Surely not. The high canter picked up the flask. A silver container that fit perfectly in his hand. And he pulled the lid free. He dipped the needle into the mouth of the flask. 
when he withdrew it. It was coated in a translucent liquid. Icor. Before I could comment, he jabbed the needle into my hand. With a gasp, I jerked my hand away. The high canter didn't seem to notice. The swift, precise movements belied his arthritic fingers. He held the needle near the very top of the empty page, where a first letter might go. One drop fell from the point and landed, perfect and round, against the page. For a moment, I wondered if that was all there was to it, and then my knees buckled, and I almost fell. My vision blurred, doubled. The first image crept over the second like the sun setting. I caught myself on the podium, pushed myself straight, as the second image settled smoothly in place. As if of its own accord, my head turned, and my eyes met the center eye of my god. As I watched, the cloud over its eye fell away, revealing a dark as deep as the void, and glimmers behind. As if the god, chained below the church, truly had swallowed up the stars. As if it would swallow me up as well. I blinked and was free. The chained god's eye was clouded, and its head turned, as if it had forgotten about me completely. Admittedly, I reached for the cloth in my pocket to staunch the sprouting blood from my finger. No! The cantor said, yanking the cloth away. He sounded out of breath. No more of that. Not for you. Drink. A flask was shoved into my uninjured hand. Ikor, my god's blood. I tilted the flask to my lips. The liquid was cool, cloying like honey on my tongue. It was an afterbite like ashes. It spilled down my throat with a fire that smoldered in my chest. The heat sent tendrils throughout my body, making me gasp. The heat burned deeper, hotter in some places. The rawness of my wrists from the shackles, my calf where I'd stretched wrong, the arches of my feet where I'd been standing all day all seared as though red coals had been burning beneath my flesh. But above all else, roots of fire shot down my palm. The pain seared into my bones, bursting stars inside my eyes, as if my hands had been set alight and my bones were kindling. And then, the pain was gone. My eyes opened to find my hand clenched, blood seeping between fingers until it threatened to drip. The high canter guided my hand open and roughly scrubbed at the blood. Beneath, the wound was gone. My wrists, my calf, even the arches of my feet, all were free from their complaints. The price of our god's healing, Cantor Raz said. All the pain and injury would ever cause, all at once. Perhaps our god can't spare us that. Or perhaps... Perhaps there are lessons only pain can teach. The high canter frowned, looking at our god. Then, with a smile that never touched the bleakness in his eyes, he said, Congratulations, Lance. That's it? I asked. As he tucked the cloth away, patted my back. On the page, a single dot glowed a solid sunset orange. I always imagined ceremony and fanfare, a feast in my honor, and flowers thrown at my feet. I'd known that that was not the way. My god was not one for such artifice not when people still suffered. And yet, I should have felt different. I've presided over too many deaths to celebrate. He almost sounded ashamed as he said, I'm 
glad I'll not see you more. I nodded, blinking back stinging tears. The sword had been the one he'd carried into the fallen lands. His flask. His book. The last of them. If I returned, and some day someone else took up the lance, I would be the one to show them our god. To perform this binding. And if I didn't return, well, the High Cantor wouldn't be doing this again in any case. Cantor Arras hesitated on the edge of speaking. In times like these, we search for what hope we can afford. Sometimes our hopes are small, bitter things, clutched in our hands, even as they make us bleed. The confusion must have been clear on my face. He eyed my hand, still stained with blood from the ceremony. I'd hoped that you'd follow after me one day. That as the next high canter, you could bring comfort to our people. He turned from the altar, his chains ringing hollow against the stone. I am following after you, I said. I opened my mouth, but the words didn't come. I hoped you would be proud. He paused, but didn't face me. I watched his shoulders straighten, as though drawing over those human bones the costume of the leader Yimrit. Come. You have questions. I may have answers while there's still time. I hope you'll wait until the morning, at least, before you set out. Turning for one last look at my god, I wondered if there were any answers that would make my journey easier. My god doesn't look back, its eye blind and all seeing, vast enough to swallow the cosmos. This has been chapters 1 and 2 of An Altar on the Village Green from Book 1 of The Chained God, written by Nathan Hall. Edited by Sarah Chorn. Original print cover by Luke Tarzian. And podcast cover by Van Fulfs. Copyright 2021 by Nathan Hall. All rights reserved.